Lieutenant, you were a lieutenant in November of 2014. Are you now a captain in, by your department's rankings? Or? Our department has uh, has changed names. Okay. My paycheck tells me I'm a lieutenant still. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Right it's like a bank bank title. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the state had asked you, but I'm aware you prepared an incident report with regard to your involvement in this case, did you not? I did. And that included a narrative description of your involvement uh, in the case, uh, isn't that correct? That's correct. And you filled that out, I believe, that either that night or the, the, the next morning of the 17th, is that correct? Yes. Okay. In addition to filling out your own department's uh, incident report. Uh, you were interviewed at Linwood Fire Station 15, were you not? I was. And you provided a tape-recorded statement to <coughs> Detectives Jorgensen and Conheim with regard um, to your involvement in the case, correct? Correct. Okay. And as you told them, as you testified this morning, your, your engine was first on the scene to a reported uh, heavy house fire, correct? Correct. And, and just to uh, make sure it's clear for everyone, your department basically runs engines with like a three-man crew, is that correct? That's correct. And you were on it, and who was driving, and who was the other fireman? I, firefighter Willis was my driver, Firefighter Boone's Reprisal was my firefighter. Okay. And... Um, was it only after you pulled up to the house in the cul-de-sac that you realized the potential problem you faced with access to water and, and gave the directions about having someone else contact that further out fire hydrant? We have a map book of all the hydrants in the area. I, I knew that we were going to have a water, a water supply help on that one. Uh, the, the call initially came in at a different address and a different street, so I, I had to look at that as well I had to adjust to that okay and, and so as you got as your unit actually pulled in in front of this home uh, what were you able to observe about the fire that the majority of the fire was on the back side of the building okay and it was heavily involved okay and I treated it and I believe announced as a fully involved fire so that other units know that we have a, a large amount of fire to fight and was there significant flame and smoke billowing from, from the house? Correct. And, and was there uh, flame or smoke coming out of the front portion of the house as well? Just smoke from okay. the front. Smoke was coming out the front? Okay. Yeah. And you indicated that when you uh, first came into contact with Mr. Morgan, 
he was either um, stumbling or, or kneeling or, or, or crawling, but, but he certainly wasn't standing up, correct? Correct. And he was um, to the uh, uh, side of the garage, between the garage and the front door on the other side of a parked vehicle? Correct. Okay. And uh, was he in part obscured by smoke out in front of the house? before you first realized he was there? No, the smoke was higher, okay. higher level, not, a, not ground level. Okay, okay. And when you ran into him, he was uh, coughing and choking and uh, either to be on, to have fallen down or to be falling down, is that correct? Correct. And, and you helped him up, did you not? I did. And, and one of the first things you asked him was if there was anyone else in the house, correct? That's correct. And he didn't respond verbally, but he pointed at the garage, didn't he? Yes. And ultimately, he said something like garage and handed you the garage door opener, didn't he? He handed me the, he handed me the garage door opener. And I don't recall if he said the word garage or mumbled it or I inferred it. Okay. D did you have a chance to review the tape recorded statement you gave to the detectives on November 17th. Yes. And do you recall um, in that statement uh, telling them, I asked him if anyone else was in the house. He didn't say anything. He pointed. At first he pointed and then he said something like garage and handed me a garage door opener. Do you recall saying that to, to the detectives? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it was after getting that garage door opener that you then helped him uh, away uh, from that area in front of the garage by the vehicle, correct? Correct. And, and you helped him down uh, down to where your fire engine was parked or to the, the second engine that arrived? My fire engine. Okay. And did you do that by yourself or with someone else? Um, by myself. Okay. Um, Now, after you sort of, uh, did you sit him down or how, how, what did you do when you brought him back to your engine? I don't recall. Okay. Were there uh, medics or uh, other firefighters there to be able to take, out, take over looking after him? Firefighter Willis, who was the pump operator, was there. And there was a moment where I asked him to look after him while I gave direction to someone else. Okay. And, and who did you give direction to at that time? Mike Johnston, who was the officer on 815 that day. Okay. Aid. 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 A -I -D, aid. And, and, and that designation, the medic aid vehicle is attached to Station 15 uh, is A-15 or Aid-15 and the engine is E15 or engine 15 and similar designations for uh, firehouse 14 or, or correct okay. um, and after uh, uh, starting to, to, to talk with firefighter Johnson and, and redirect some of the new crews that were coming in did you go back to uh, Mr. Morgan the victim that you'd helped down by the uh, your engine. I did. Once okay. once direction was given, I, I returned to Mr. Morgan. And, and did he appear to be kind of um, in and out of it, sort of have like a, a reduced consciousness? I wouldn't have called it that. He was acting erratically, coughing, uh, attempted to uh, walk and stumble. Uh, he was stumbling and, and kind of just erratic in a, in, a, in a motion near some trees that were in the front of the house. Okay. Do you remember telling the detectives he was kind of in, about, in and out of it, you know? He wasn't unconscious, but he wasn't paying attention. Do you recall us telling them that? Yes. And you recall asking him whether anybody else was in the house, and he kept pointing at the garage. Isn't that correct? He pointed, yes. So at that point, did you attempt to, you, to, to work the garage door open? I did. A and was it then that you realized the garage just sort of went up and down and seemed to be malfunctioning? That's right. Okay. 
Um, and, and while this was going on, Mr. Morgan kept trying to get up and go back towards the house, didn't he? Yes. Okay. And But when he would do that, he would appear to fall down and get up, and you sort of had to yell at him to just sit down and stay there? Yes. Okay. Um, and again, at this point, you were sort of yelling at him to be clear as whether somebody else was in the house. And again, he said something about the garage and pointed that way, correct? And that's when you assigned the other officer to go? At that time, I do remember him pointing. I don't remember any words. Okay. Do you remember telling the detectives, when I yelled at him, I said, hey, anybody else in the house? And then he said something about the garage and pointed that way. And then, so I told another firefighter, go check that garage. And that's when they found the woman. Is that correct? Is yeah, that, that, that sounds correct, yes. Okay. Um, and when you described him uh, to the officers, they asked you if you had seen where uh, he had come from, whether he had come from the house or he was already out of the house. And you had told them he was, when you first saw him, he was already out. He came out of the smoke, right? Isn't that what you told them? Correct. Smoke by the front door. Okay. Um, and you were certainly the first firefighter on the scene, but you don't know whether there could have been other neighbors or other individuals who may have had contact with Mr. Morton. I didn't see anybody else. Okay. Um, well, you didn't see anyone else contact him, but you did see other people there at the scene, neighbors, correct? Correct. Okay. And the garage door opener that he gave you appeared to be one of those ones that would come from a car, correct? Correct. And when you found him, he was off to the side door of a car parked directly in front of the garage, was he not? He was in front of the car. Do you know whether that car was locked or whether that garage door opener had come from that car? I do not know. Now, you called for the medic aid crew to assist him and provide him with treatment at the scene, correct? Correct. And given the way he was acting and the circumstance that you were there, there was concern for uh, potential smoke inhalation, correct? Correct. And uh, his behaviors, his, his erratic behavior is also potentially consistent with uh, someone who is concussed. Isn't that correct? Potentially. Okay. And you didn't have, he, he wasn't, he was pointing, but he wasn't effectively verbally communicating with you uh, about his situation, correct? Correct. And he, he certainly appeared to be uh, coughing and in some degree of distress, correct? Correct. Now, you indicated that uh, uh, dealing with him and getting aid for him delayed you specifically in your uh, ability to respond to actually applying water to the fire, correct? It delayed me, yes. Okay. And, and I guess to the same effect, firefighters assisting the woman in the garage delayed them from being able to specifically fight that fire, right? The, those crews had to tend to her and not fight the fire. Right. But for all of you, from your crew, the other crews, all of the firemen responding, caring for individuals at the scene of the fire is your primary concern, correct? That is our primary. And, and, and certainly um, any delay in responding to the fire to ensure that somebody's okay and get the medical treatment is something you'll do each and every time, correct? Yes. If we see a victim, that's our first priority. Okay. And, and, and that was the circumstance when you came in contact with Mr. Morgan, correct? That was my, that was my priority. Okay. Um, well, I might just have a moment. During the time that you were with Mr. Morgan, 
you weren't masked up, right? I was not. And so uh, you didn't have your regulator on, you didn't have anything that would have prevented you from smelling uh, odors of gasoline or accelerant had they been present on his person, correct? I had no mask, I, I, just my nose. And there was no odor of gas or any other accelerant about Mr. Morgan's person, was it? I, I never smelled that. And certainly, if you had, you would have noted it in your report. Would I would you have. Okay. You were asked about anything unusual about the fire. And I think there was some mention uh, about the fire burning faster than you would have thought it should have, correct? I did believe that at that time. Okay. And ultimately you learned that the, the large room in the back of the house, which seemed to be the primary uh, location of the strongest blaze, um, was not sheet rubbed. Isn't that correct? I, I found that out later on after the fire was extinguished. Okay. Now, uh, sheet rocking would have uh, a somewhat uh, retardant effect on the fire as opposed to the bare studs and bare wood, correct? So sheet rock protects the bare wood, is that, that yes. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily call that a fire retardant. Oh, okay, I, that, might, that might be too great a leap, but, okay. but fire burns faster on the exposed wood than it would in a sheetrock room, correct? That, it, that is correct. Okay. And so the unusual speed with which the back of that house and then the, the house seemed to be going up um, made more sense when you understood that that room didn't have sheetrocking than until you learned that information, correct? So. At the scene, when I learned that, that clued me in to assume that's why the fire was burning as hot as it did and as fast as it did. And, and, and that's what you told the detectives, that because there was no sheetrock, it made sense that the, that's why it went so fast, because there wasn't protection, correct? That, that's correct. That's what I told him. Okay. I have no other questions. I thank you much. Thank you. Redirect. Did you end up leaving the defendant with uh, Firefighter Peterson? Yes. Uh, Firefighter Peterson was on the medic unit. That yes, we we put uh, we put the defendant in the we put the victim, the male victim, into the medic unit, which was. Medic 15, Peterson, yes. Thank you. No further questions? Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to tell everybody who you are. I'm Detective Arnett with the Lima Police Department. Okay. And why don't you spell both the first and last name for us? Jacqueline, J A C Q U E L I N E, Arnett, A R N E T T. And what do you do for a living then? I'm a detective with the Lima Police Department. How long have you been a police officer? Eight years. And how long have you been a detective? Four years. Uh, as part of your um, work for the Linwood Police Department, did you get involved in the early days of the uh, case involving uh, the injuries to Brenda Welsh? Correct, yes. And what were you specifically assigned to do or asked to do? 
uh, to collect evidence from the victim. Did you come to learn that she was down at Harborview Hospital? I did. And uh, did you go down to Harborview? I did. Uh, were you permitted in time to see her in the intensive care unit or wherever she was at the hospital? Yes. How many different times did you go down and see her? I believe I went three times. And over those periods of time, were you able to see for, for the injuries or wounds to her? Yes, the staff was very accommodating. And they understood who you were and why you were there? Absolutely. Were you able to, to uh, see sort of what it is you needed to see for the, for, to document injuries and to observe the injuries? Uh, the first time, not as much. She was she had a lot of uh, bandages, and we didn't want to mess with that. And so we made an appointment to photograph her again when her wound care team would be exposing all of her injuries right. to change the wounds. And then you went bandages. back the third time. Correct. So were you able to see both a uh, different wounds in a progression of, of injuries? Absolutely. I'm going to show you a series of photographs. Um, some of which you may have taken, some of which you haven't, but um, the question for each of these is going to be if they accurately depict what it is you saw about Brenda, whether you took them or not, you can tell us, but just as long as they accurately depict. Numbers, let's do them one at a time here if you don't mind. Number Your Honor, four. Your briefly object, if I could take a look at the other performances during oh, shows. You just, these are the ones I just showed you oh. during the break. Okay. I'll show you again what we do. This is both the way. In fact, uh, you recognize that? Yes. In fact, is that one that you actually took? Yes. And does that accurately show what uh, Brenda looked like in the a day or two after this event? Two days, I believe. Two days after that. Describe for us what that what that shows. So this depicts um, Brenda from the right side. Uh, it shows an injury. Um, to the top of the two injuries to the top of her head, one along the left side and one along the right side, and then also three long marks along the the right side of her head, uh, just across the ear, the top, across the top of her ear, that area. Off into the four. Correct. Um, the off from off into the four. Honor, no, no objection. Exhibit four, please. You would and Barbara, if you would assist us to make this more. said there are some long lacerations. Um, You'll see it there above the ear. There's three. My thumb is closest to the third one. Oh, is that your thumb? That is my thumb. Right. One, two. Show you exhibit number four. Uh, five, excuse me. Tell me about that. So this would be the left side of Brenda's head. <laughs> And you'll see some of that injury that you can that you can see in the this photograph as it comes across the top of her of top of her head along the left side. Um, she also has an injury above her. Right, left. Hold on, hold on one second. Sure. We're going to do this a little bit easier. Uh, does that accurately show what she looked like the two days after the fight? It does. And you took that photo. I did. We offer exhibit five, please. No objection. Exhibit five. So now that that's up here, when we let you. Thank you. So tell me about what you're seeing here. 
So it's that continuation of the injury across the forehead that you saw in the first photograph. Um, at this distance, it's a little more difficult to see, but you'll see some of a mark across her eyebrow there, just above the left eye. Um, it had stitches and sutures there. And then you can see that the is rest... This, is this what you're talking about? Correct. And then, you know, clearly a lot of bandages making it difficult to see what else might be there. Did she have some injuries to her back? She did. Let me show you what we've marked as exhibit six. You recognize that? I do. Does that show some injuries to her back? Yes, and also to her, um, to her butt, to her buttocks. And does it accurately show what she looked like a um, day or two after the fight? Yeah, this would be um, probably, I think, maybe five days later when she was getting her bandages changed by the wound care team. And again, I believe you took that photo. I did. Offer exhibit uh, six, is that right? No objection. Exhibit six would be in there. Tell us what we're seeing here. Um, so you'll see some burns to the top of her back. Um, and then also to her buttocks there. In the center, that uh, was notified by the the staff that that's actually a, a medically induced uh, injury of sorts to allow spinal fluid to... Uh, right there on that button at the top, there's a... Yeah, there you go. So this is to allow the spinal fluid to uh, release. But the rest of them, these are burns. So that's a burn, that's a burn, and that's a burn. I'll show you... Um, you said you went there five days later. Uh, let me show you another picture taken five days after the assault. It was not taken by you, was it? Was no, it? no, this photograph is not. And this was photograph number eight. But you saw her that day, is that right? I believe so. And does that accurately look like what she looked like uh, when you saw her? Yes. Right offer exhibit number in, uh, eight, is that right? Mm -hmm. I would object at this point. I don't believe the foundation's been laid. She said she believes she believes so. She doesn't know if that actually reflects what she saw. That's my understanding. Sorry, I believe the I believe was the Wait. date. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Want me to clarify that or do you not know? I'm satisfied. The objection will be overruled and the date will be a good time. Thank you. So And um, what is it we're seeing in this photo? Or what did you see that this photo shows? Uh, this shows Brenda from about the mid-level chest up. You can see a number of injuries that were covered by the bandages the first day that I had arrived. Um, a great deal of burning. I'll show you another photograph taken this. Number nine, again, this is not a photograph you took, is it? No. But does that show uh, injuries <coughs> to Brenda that, uh, that you witnessed? Yes. And does it accurately show injuries to Brenda as you witnessed them? Yes. I would offer to number nine. No objection. Number nine will be in a minute. Tell us what we're looking at here. And what you saw that this picture shows? Additional burns that I was not able to see the first day I was there, again, because they were covered up by bandages. Did you get to see her back? I did. And I'm going to show you photograph number 11. Thank you. And again, is that a picture you took? No. But does that picture show injuries that you saw and accurately reflect those injuries? Yes. Uh, I'd offer exhibit number 11. No objection. Exhibit 11 will be admitted. Tell us what we're looking at here, please. Uh, this would be Brenda from the middle of her back up. And these are all burns to her backs and back and shoulders. Um, you can see a little bit of her neck and head. 
Did you notice, um, by the way, one time when you were there, an injury to her uh, finger on her left hand? Yes. And did you know up front what that was? No, I mean, I try to. I try it to the best of my ability without being a doctor to say whether it might be a burn or an abrasion or simply a mark. So, um, what I've laid before you is photograph number 44. Right. Uh, is that a photograph that you took <clears throat> of an injury to left Brenda's left, the index finger of her left hand? Yes. And uh, you took that one. I, yes, and that actually shows the injury that that you saw. Yes. I think it's the 44. Objection. 44 will be in later. Did you say objection or no objection? No objection. Um, thank you. One other thing. You, and thank you, we're done with that. Helpful. You also um, collected some biological samples from uh, Brenda, did you not? I did. Explain to the jury who, how you collect um, basically DNA samples from an individual. We call them buckle swabs and we do it by taking two what appears to be long Q-tips and rubbing it on the interior cheek walls on both sides. And buckle, B-U-C-C-A-L. Correct. And it's uh, the swab is like a Q-tip. Did yes. you, and is that the standard procedure? For yes. Uh, did you take a swab of uh, the DNA from uh, Brenda? Yes. And you secure that or mark that in some way? I do. And how is that done? The evidence item is marked with my initials and the evidence item number. You told us your name is Jackie Arnett. We now get to learn what your middle initial is. Emily. Okay. So I'm going to hand you a bag that's been marked as exhibit number 43. I showed that to you earlier. Which has the initials J-E-A and the number two. Can you tell me what that is? This is the buckle swabs that I collected from Brenda. And you um, explain to the jurors the process of taking those and preserving them to make sure that they remain pristine, untampered with whatnot? Uh, when I take this, the swab, I'm wearing gloves so that I don't contribute to the sample. Uh, the sample is immediately placed into a sterile, small cardboard box and placed inside this bag. So you're seeing it almost in the same condition I collected it in. Um, the bag is then secured, so it's a double layer of protection, sealed and then labeled um, by me. And I would offer it to the 43 please. No objection. Uh, Mr. Langman reminds me that we, I never asked to show to the jury uh, photograph 44 fingers, so let me uh, display that for you and ask you if you can tell me what that is. you need the last step? Nah, I think we're okay. Yes, that is the photograph I took of Brenda's left hand. Okay. And could you tell what that injury at the tip was? At the time, it looked like a burn to me. Objection. I think this is speculation, what the injury is. No foundation for her identifying. That's perfectly fine. I'm happy with the question. Let me rephrase it. Leave it at that. Did you, did, and the jury disregard the answer. Did you know for certain what that was? No. Perfect. Thank you. That's all I wanted to ask you. That's it. Cross examination. Uh, Your Honor, I have no questions. Thank you, ma'am. You may step down. You're excused. We will get back in. Right. And obviously, you still remain under subpoena. We, you, you may get called back for other things. While you walk out, would you ask Mr. Peterson to walk on in and you're free to go for the day? Thanks.
Before you sit down, Mr. Reagan, very quickly. Please. You saw Ms. Ware over for a testimony you're about to give in this matter. Is it true that Ms. Ware is not about to give in this matter? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Tell everybody who you are, if you would, please. My name is Joshua Douglas Peterson. I'm a paramedic and firefighter with the city of Linwood. Can you spell Peterson for us? P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N. You ever testified before? I have not. And you've been sitting here all day, right? Correct. Okay. So uh, what we've heard a little bit about you, but tell us a little bit about your background, how long you've been a firefighter, what training you've got, that sort of thing. Uh, I've been doing firefighter type work since I was 18 and started volunteering, which uh, has been, I guess, close to 20 years. Um, as far as a paramedic, I've been uh, um, a paramedic for uh, um, for almost 15 years this year. Um, paramedic school, I went to Central Washington University. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Paramedicine from there. Um, my uh, our training there consists of over 2,500 hours of, uh, of, um, of both patient contact and uh, classroom training. Um, and from there, I've, uh, I've worked, I worked a couple different fire departments before working in Linwood, and I've been in Linwood since 2006. At somebody earlier today used the phrase that every day is a training day. Is that phrase common to you? Yes. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we, uh, we train on shift, and so we're always learning something new. Um, that's how our, uh, our day is spent, um, aside from going on calls. And going on calls is also our, a training opportunity. I mean, you might say, uh, because of our job, um, every, every call can be different. There's just such a variety. So you're constantly learning and, um, from every call, from every patient. There's always something new to learn. Do you spend more time dealing with injured people than you do actually fight fires? Absolutely, yeah. It's up in the 90-something percent that are medical or trauma calls um, as compared to fire calls. And by medical or trauma, I want to make sure we all know what you mean by that. So what do you mean by those terms? Okay. Um, they are, uh, well, a medical would be any uh, sickness, uh, medical emergency, any illness. Um, trauma could be anything from a uh, grandma falling off her step to uh, injured finger to a car accident. Um, those are our majority of calls, or those um, are where you require an ambulance, someone needs to go to the hospital. Yeah. And as part of your job, uh, do you provide treatment for patients? Yes, as a paramedic, that is, um, because, of, uh, because of that extensive schooling and training, that's, uh, that level is, uh, to provide, um, to provide care to the patients. Um, as paramedics in Washington State, we actually are uh, given a higher level of training and also um, uh, almost uh, given more um, ability to perform uh, functions that in the past actually only physicians have, uh, have done in the past. But in Washington State, it's different procedures and, uh, that we're able to do uh, for patients. I was gonna ask you about that. In the Seattle area in particular in, in Washington, mm -hmm. Do paramedics have a greater medical leeway than the rest of the country? We do, and it, it, it comes out of just um, the quality of training. For one thing, it started there. Um, a lot of the uh, paramedic and, and EMS system, the emergency medical service system, uh, started in the Seattle area. And so um, there's just a quality training program here, and, uh, and, the, and because of that, um, procedures and, and skills are... Um, there's just more that we can do and are allowed to do here. Do you get training from Harborview doctors and medical personnel? Yeah, a lot of a lot of firefighters go to Harborview. We have continuing training through that program as well. My initial training was at Central Washington University where I received a, a four-year degree there, but um, yeah, there's a few other places in the state that have training, but our continued training, we, we, we get through Harborview and uh, through the doctors there. So I asked you if you uh, get to treat, you've explained that, but before you treat, is there a part of the job of assessment? Absolutely, yeah. Explain that process to us. Okay. Um, our, our patient, uh, we would call the patient uh, exam or assessment. Um, we, 
it always kind of starts with, on a typical call, it would start with interviewing the patient, find out what their problem is or what is hurting, what is, uh, you know, what, why they're calling us there today, basically. And from that, we develop a line of questioning. So our questioning isn't always the same. However, depending on what their symptoms are, or the complaint, it will typically follow down a certain path of follow-up questions. And then along with that is our exam of the patient. And we have, we have what would be like a primary exam um, if we're checking the patient for injuries, which is a quick kind of, quick kind of uh, exam through of the patient. And then a secondary is more in-depth follow-through. And we do both those exams too. Why is it important to both get a history, that is what the person is saying, and compare it with sort of objective findings? <clears throat> Well, um, our, the history what we're, and what we're seeing, you know, I think we, we use what their complaint is, we use that as a piece of evidence, and we use what we're seeing as evidence, and we use our vital signs and what we're getting to as evidence to all kind of create a picture for us on the patient. And I use evidence of, I mean, in the terms of we're, we're sitting there trying to determine what's going on with this patient, um, whether it's medical or trauma. And so we're using these tools um, really to come up with a conclusion and determine if everything fits together to determine a certain yeah, symptom. Let me ask you this, and, and to be clear, we're not talking about this in the context of this case, no. but if somebody were to provide some history, would you, would you compare symptoms to see if maybe they were making things up because they wanted narcotics and they wanted to try to get something. Is that a concern? Is that part of the, the, the analysis that you're going through? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, we definitely use their their story and does it match what we're seeing. And you've got to be careful about malingering? Yeah, I mean we we have because we have people that will we have people that will tell us lies for whatever reason to uh, to get um, like you mentioned, the narcotics or, or whatever it might be, but we so we um, we definitely have to investigate of based on our vital signs and what we're seeing too. Sure. And so with that 17, 18 years of doing that and comparing what they're saying to what you're seeing, I want to get you involved in this particular case. You responded to a fire uh, on November 16, 2014. Correct. And your partner that day was? Kevin Miller. And tell us, um, we've heard all day about the fire, but just give us briefly how you got there, how quickly you got there, and what you were asked to do. Okay. The fire came in around 7 in the evening, I believe, mm -hmm. um, maybe just after. Uh, the response was, was a, a pretty quick one. I think uh, most of our units were um, available to respond and not on other calls um, because of the kind of direct routes to the fire. I think we, we arrived just maybe just after three minutes after getting our call, which is a pretty quick response for our area. Um, and so we were called out for a residential structure fire. Um, on, on our way in, we uh, noticed, and I think we were advised by the first engine coming of the column of smoke, which on our way there, that's our indicator that this is actually a fire burning and we knew we were going to an actual fire versus, you know, a uh, false alarm. Um, and I, I, we, we arrived, as we arrived, actually, um, we were told on the radio as we were just pulling up that there was um, possibly a victim for the fire and that they would need us because we were on a paramedic unit. We were a able to do firefighter work or if there's a victim, um, then we're, we go into the mode of doing medical work. So we were uh, advised that we were going to be needed for this patient. And when you got there, did you get there within a couple of minutes of the alarm? Yeah, it was. I think it was around three minutes or so that we arrived. Yeah. And when you get there, who directed you to do something and what did they direct you to do? Uh, I think it was Lieutenant Putz that I believe he was probably was on the radio. Yes, he, he was on the radio who advised that there was a, a victim and they'd need Medic 15, which is the unit I was on. Um, and then as we approached, because we had to walk a little ways down the road uh, to get to it, um, as we approached, uh, he, it was Lieutenant Putz that pointed out, you know, that's your patient there. 
Would you, do you recognize the fellow in the purple in the middle there as the fellow you took care of? I do. And uh, when, at some point, were you, with, with, you're more experienced than Miller? Correct. Were you and Miller assigned to provide medical attention to him? We were. Um, because it was our unit, the way we function typically is um, because there's with two paramedics on that unit, um, one will be considered a lead paramedic, um, kind of doing the questioning and that kind of thing, and he'd do the report. Um, that was Kevin Miller for that call. We switch every call. And then my, my task as the other paramedic would be kind of the skills paramedic, doing things uh, to kind of take care of the patient. But we intertwine and, sure. and kind of work together on both but of those. Basically, but we were both assigned, our unit was assigned for this patient. So you're both involved, but one's sort of more hands-on and one's more writing yeah. notes. Yeah, and because, because there's two of us, we can kind of, okay. you know, if there's another job to do for a second, we can, we can work together. And, and you were the more hands-on guy? I was on this patient early, yes. Mm -hmm. So what did, what, walk us through, what, what okay. did you see? And, yeah. What did you hear? What did he tell you? What so you as uh, Lieutenant Putz pointed him out, uh, what, I, so what I noticed is, uh, is the gentleman uh, lying on the ground um, next to our fire engine. It was the fire engine that's pumping water for the fire, so it's, it's loud, it's running, you know, it's just everything about it is loud and you, you don't really get a full sense, you couldn't really do a good evaluation of a patient right next to it. Mm -hmm. um, so as I, my plan was to move him away from it. He was laying on his side, looked like he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't moving, uh, looked unconscious. So I'm thinking this is an unconscious patient from this fire and he's going to be a critical patient. Um, what I did notice though, almost right away was that, I mean, doing this job, you just notice things when they don't look like they normally do. Sure. Um, and I noticed that his clothing did not appear dirty or soot covered or what I would expect from someone that would be unconscious from a house fire. Um, I expected they had been in the, the fire and smoke. Um, he's lying there and I went to grab his shoulder to move him and as soon as I did that, he turned and yelled back, what are you doing? And it, it caught me off guard because I thought this was a person who wasn't going to be responsive at all. Um, it was just so purposeful and just like, you know, clear. It wasn't, there wasn't, it wasn't confused or anything about asking, it was a very clear person who was just surprised by me grabbing their shoulder. Okay. Um, so I, you know, I told I'm trying to help you, or I gotta check you out here, and I pulled him away from, from the engine. And, uh, um, and then, yeah. have you, you've, you told us earlier you've dealt with um, people who have traumatic injury? Yes. Medical conditions? Yes. Um, and, have you dealt with folks who have had possible concussions? Absolutely, yeah. Give us an idea. We're talking so tens of times, hundreds of times. For people that have been altered levels, hundreds to maybe thousands times of, I mean, altered levels of consciousness, concussions, yeah, hundreds of times. And are you trained to look for signs of concussion? Yes. Um, are you experienced in looking for signs of concussion? Yes. What kinds of things would you look for? Typically a person um, will be confused, is a main component, can be confused, um, confused of the events and confused of the, the surrounding event right then, confused what's going on. Uh, you get a lot of times what's called perseverating. A person will ask the same question over and over again. Um, they just won't get a sense of what's What's happening to me right now? Um, you see that a lot. Um, do, we will, oh, yes, oh, keep, keep just going. other things. Uh, people can be nauseated. Um, they can have altered vision, um, different, uh, different, yeah, there's different signs that can show up there. But um, I just didn't, yeah, I wasn't seeing that initially. That wouldn't, have pop, that didn't pop into my head. Um, so, th there's no confusion that I was aware of. You did this patient of yours complain of having altered vision? No. Complain of being nauseous? No. Throw up? No. Uh, you said they weren't confused. 
Uh, during the course of your time with Mr. Morgan, were there times when you had to give him particular directions? Yes. Did he follow them? Yes. Does a concussion <laughs> cause confusion to sort of go in and out? I mean, is there like intermittent concussions? I have not seen that. In the thousands of cases? Never seen I have that. not seen that. Um, was were there times when he did not respond to your questions? He yes, he would not respond. To his he would close, have his eyes closed and would not answer back. Were there times when he when he did respond to your questions? Yes. Were the words clear, articulate? They were clear. Uh, no slurring of words or anything. No. What did that mean to you as you're doing your assessment? That sometimes he'd answer, sometimes he wouldn't, but it was always articulate. Clear. Yeah. To me, it was. Um, it was very purposeful, um, uh, purposefully uh, choosing what to say and when to say it is how it appeared. And it seemed like his, uh, the closing the eyes, the choosing not to respond back, it just, it just seemed like um, kind of overly exa exaggerated um, behavior is what I was witnessing. So you had taken care of thousands of patients. Have you ever seen anyone act in this way before? Not in the way he acted. No. One of the, uh, did you feel he needed to, well, you were aware of the fire. Mm -hmm. Were you concerned, hey, maybe there's some smoke inhalation or whatnot? Yeah. So are there exams to do that? Yes. Now, if somebody is coughing, <coughs> can you tell if that's a real cough or a fake cough just by listening? Not just by hearing it, no. Okay. Yeah, if you figure out if they're coughing because there's something really a reason to, right. uh, do you have to do an examination? Correct. And for you, did you have a place to do an examination? Yes. How did that take place? Well, after we kind of had some questioning of him out there, you know, next to the engine in the dark. When we then able to examine him, we moved him to the medic unit. Uh, the back of the medic unit is, is just a little more like an exam room, like you'd have for a hospital or some better, good lighting, and, and we have all our tools that we need there. And um, so in the back of there, um, that was where my, my exam of, of, of the defendant took place. Um, it was, uh, it, I had what I had to, wanted to verify initially was you know are there any any reason for this this altered level of consciousness that I'm just not seeing outside right. I've already it appears there's something going on outside the normal so when I examined him in there um, I did several things I uh, listened to his lung sounds which were clear and that's what we would listen to because you know like you say with the cough and that kind of thing you can't just determine by the sounds so we listened to lung sounds which were clear. Um, I asked him to open his mouth for me, uh, which he did right away. His, he, as he lay in there, his eyes were closed. He wasn't, you know, really, um, his eyes were closed and he just lay in there. But um, he quickly opened to follow command, which uh, was appropriate and right to open his, open his mouth. I looked in his mouth and it was, uh, it was clear and pink and, and no sign of any soot. That's something we always look for because if a person has inhaled any smoke or anything, we will see soot in their, their mouth, um, especially like on their tongue, it will stick to it, um, also in their nose. I didn't see any sign of that at all. Um, I also noticed that he had glasses that I had removed. Uh, there was no sign of soot on them and glasses are just one of those things, glass just, uh, if there's any smoke, it just, it's the first thing to kind of cling to glass. Um, and they were clean and clear. Uh, I could not find, on my exam of him, um, I didn't have any complaints from him of injury or illness, and I didn't have, uh, make any note of any injury or illness that I was finding. And you're trying to, uh, is, is, along your assessment, you're trying to figure out if there's a real injury or just a complaint of, but not real injury, is that Yeah, because at this point, all I'm, I'm seeing this behavior component, mm -hmm. um, which to me, like I guess they just looked, it all, everything about it appeared overly exaggerated um, um, behavior and uh, purposeful behavior. Um, 
And so I'm trying to see, is there any reason for this that I'm missing why he could be acting this way? And I'm not finding anything. I'm not finding any injury. I'm not finding any medical problem with him. You said you're in the back of your um, medic unit. Yeah. Pretty good light? It's great light, yeah. More than that's in here? Yeah, three different sets. We have rows of lights and then we have fluorescent lights that come on and it's great lights. It'd be like you're uh, in, a, in a hospital room with the bright lights pointing down and stuff like an operating room. And with all that, you can find any sort, any, how about head injury? You're looking for head injury? Yeah, you know, you look, you do any kind of a, a scan of his head, and you do, you can do like what would be like a blood sweep, it's, we call it. It's just because we have our gloves on, and you rub your head, see if there's any blood. And I didn't find any sign of any injury on him in my exam. Okay. So, with the gloves, you, you see if maybe there's a bloody injury that you can't see. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you check your, your right. gloves. Right. And they're also laying on a white sheet and white. Pillowcase. So find if any there's blood any, you, find I, any I, didn't, blood your I didn't see any. Any blood? Any blood on the white sheet? I did not see any. You see any head injury whatsoever? No. Uh, once you concluded that there was nothing about him, that, well, did you conclude there was nothing about him? Well, did you think he needed any additional medical? What I, what I felt is that um, I was kind of in the middle of examining when, we, when I heard that there was another victim. Um, and so because I knew our medic unit was the closest one to the fire scene, um, between myself and Kevin Miller, we decided that his, his care could wait because we're not finding anything significant, anything critical that needs to be treated because we're not finding anything. So he can wait. In other words, there can be some delay in his treatment. So we sent him to uh, another medic unit that was further down the block. And is it basic standard operating procedure to try to send somebody to the hospital? Just yeah, I mean, if somebody. I always oh, phrase the question. What what is the um, what what goes into a decision to send somebody to the hospital? Um, we try if we're called mm -hmm. to to deal with the person, mm -hmm. we we try to take them to the hospital as kind of the the ultimate care. Is the is that um, indicative of a belief, or is that part of a procedure? How does that work? So, as uh, as procedure, if we um, really our protocol is, if if we find something uh, wrong with a patient, then we would need to have a refusal signed by them if they were not to go to the hospital. Um, if if um, if someone comes, if someone has been in, or uh, if they have. Uh, if there's a chance or it's uh, it described that they have been in an environment such as a, a fire environment or they're acting abnormal, which he was, it, it, it follows a long procedure to, to have him sent to the hospital. So was that done with Mr. Morgan? It is, to my best of my knowledge, yeah, I know he was sent with another medic unit. So. And your attention got diverted to somebody else who started to say? Correct. Tell us about that. So we were told that there is uh, another victim coming out, which um, we kind of been planning a little bit for because in our interviewing of Mr. Morgan uh, by the fire engine, that's where it had been indicated that there might be somebody else um, in the house. Now let me go back to, did you use the word might there? Yeah, okay. Was that his word? No, well, so his words, when we were trying to get it out because I think it was a neighbor or somebody maybe right. said that there might be somebody else around. So when we were questioning him um, and he was lying there, um, we was saying, is there anybody else here? Is there anybody else? And it took quite a bit of asking, and then he finally just said, my wife, is what he said. And then when we pressed, okay, where? Where is she at? And then he said, uh, what I believe is he said is, he said, maybe the garage. And so that's really all the, the, the inter or information that I remember getting from him. You used the term, you had a press. Yeah, um, well, because he was laying there like he had been before with his eyes closed not answering back to us, even though I had just, I mean, this was just mere, you know, seconds, moments after where I'd moved him and he responded back of, hey, what are you doing? So I knew he could respond, he, he could talk, right? He could um, articulate. And so to me, it was this willful choice of not answering us. So that's why I think we, we kept pressing him of, give us an answer, give us an answer. And then when he, he did, and then we, more for well where in the house. So 
So based on that, you said you were sort of prepping for maybe there'd be somebody else. Right. So we thought maybe there is. Mm -hmm. Injection find somebody who later figured out was his wife. Right. And tell us about that. So, um, so I've been in the back of the paramedic unit and uh, firefighter Miller was, I think he's went over towards the house to where that other victim was. I just got the back of the paramedic unit uh, ready, knowing that patient, excuse me, was coming in. Um, and that just involves getting out all the other additional equipment I might need, anything I can try to prep for, getting an IV bag ready, that kind of thing. So they brought that patient in. Um, so I was in the medic unit when they brought her in. And this was some of the other firefighters who had taken her from. So when you say you got her in, yeah. Describe what you got her in. Okay, so she's on the gurney, on right. our gurney, our stretcher. Right. They push her in the back of the of the of the medic unit. Right. Um, when they push her in, um, that's when you know everybody's kind of have you have a better chance of with view and light to see her and kind of have that first impression, right? And I hadn't witnessed her until that point. Um, when they pushed her in, the first thing I noticed was an overwhelming smell of gasoline. Um, I, it was just it was strong, and um, and then and then you start the attention turn, turns to her and what do we see and we start doing that primary exam. What do we need to do right away? She and you do yeah. in all this EMT training, the fire training, and the schooling and the heart disease stuff. Are you trained to look at and try to analyze some of the burn injuries so you can treat them appropriately? Yes. Um, Okay, so you've got the smell, and now what do you start doing? <clears throat> so now uh, we start, I mean, they have the simple acronym of ABCs is airway, breathing, circulation. So you start at airway, and, and you see how is she, how is she breathing. Um, she had what we call agonal respirations, which was, um, it's just a shallow, inadequate breath um, and, and sporadic. Uh, they're kind of, they're typically the last respirations before they cease breathing at all, a person will have. Um, so she had that. Um, so that was our first primary concern. Of so we we had a it's called a big valve mask and it just delivers oxygen and fits a seal over their face and and breathe for this patient. So we started with that. Um, well, one of the members was doing that. Then we're ex we're examining her for to kind of move down that line of are there you know A B C the bleeding circulate or breathe excuse me um, any other additional problems you know with this patient. What else did you say? So. So we, 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 we expect to see, with a patient coming out of a fire, to see, I mean, I'm thinking in my mind, my main problems are gonna be burns or inhalation injuries. And so, but right off the bat, it was evident that she had major trauma to her head. Um, we had lacerations on her, multiple lacerations on her face and on her head. Um, she had, what I noticed of the two most obvious lacerations that I noted initially were on her upper forehead and further back on her scalp. They're both about, I would estimate, three inches long. Uh, the one further on her forehead was down to her skull. What um, do you mean down to her skull? Like you could, you could see the skull. It was deep enough to see part of the skull. Um, Let me show you a photograph we've admitted as exhibit number four. Mm -hmm. Now this is after things have been stitched. Is that? Yeah, depict? you can. Well, you, it doesn't depict near how bad it, it even looked initially. Um, the one you can see on the top of kind of her head, up above her head, was kind of the higher one. I think maybe there might even be another one that doesn't show in that picture. I, but it looked even worse because those wounds were open. Um, so there was quite a bit of blood. Her hair was very matted from blood. Um, and so right off the bat, I mean, that's, we, we noticed that, um, and obviously, like I state, she's, she has those agonal respirations. She's not conscious. Okay. Um, she, we then, then looking further down her body, moving further down her body, she had burns to her, um, above her abdomen, to her chest, up into her neck, um, and on her upper arms, uh, probably partial or second degree burns on her on her chest. She did not have a shirt on, she had a bra and that was burns. Um, and then 
moving down. Um, one second. Okay. Are those types of things that are depicted in this photograph, number nine? Yes. Okay. So this, this shows the, bre the burns to the breast. Yeah. They were, they, I assume they looked a little different or not? Yeah, I mean, they look different. There's so, you know, there's certain blackness to it, so it can look a little different before it's cleaned up. Okay. Keep going. So um, all that, yeah, the burn was all localized or there on the chest. And then kind of looking down, um, her hands were bloody, um, blood on them. Um, we don't do a very detailed exam of the hands because that's not life-threatening at this point. You know, it, it dictates based on the patient's condition. But um, she did have her, her finger, of her, uh, I believe her index finger, but it was her finger of her left hand was almost, um, we call it degloving, where it's like skin peeled back. It's just not an amputation of the finger, but the skin is peeled back on itself, so it was torn off there. Um, did notice that, which just seemed outside of ordinary. Let me go back to that injury in a moment. Okay. Let me, is this the finger? I'm showing you exhibit number 44 that you're talking about. Yeah, that in, I guess the index finger, yes. If you would turn the light, let me, let me put a photograph number 44 so we can talk about that for a moment. So that's the finger. Correct. When you saw her, did it look like that? No, I think probably the hospital has cleaned it up and there was... What did it look like from where you, where you saw? Well, I, I remember seeing that the, the pad of the finger, which is not present, really that top layer of skin, remember it peeled back. And so they probably, because it was just dead top layer of skin, I can only assume they've removed it at the hospital. I, but um, it was it's peeled back. But I did see the kind of the under part of the skin. And from like that. your medical training, from what the injury you saw, what causes that? Um, some sort of sharp trauma that would be uh, directly impacting, and um, it has to be a fast, quick, sharp trauma. I mean, to push it back like that, not just cut it, but pull it back and rip it, rip the skin back. So a sharp object moving in it. It has to be a yeah. There has to be a higher rate of speed. It's not a, an abrasion, I would say, just you know, putting your, skimming your hand or something. Thank you. Um, so keep going. You saw the injury. The so hand. we saw that hands were bloody. Um, the uh, and then, uh, you know, sometimes you notice things that aren't, um, they aren't, an injury, but they're, they stand out. Like I said earlier, something stands out because it's not normal. Right. Um, it's not what you expect. Um, her pants, other than maybe a little bit of dirt on the knees, her pants and like high heel black boots, um, they were just looked, I mean, clean, pristine clean, um, and uh, uh, not burnt. Like I might expect if someone was in a fire and had burns to them, you know, you expect multiple sites, but the pants, and then there might have been a little burn or um, something on the kind of the upper left thigh, but the rest of the pants um, clean, boots clean, and. Uh, so I didn't, we didn't see any, I don't even know that, <clears throat> I guess we removed the boots on the way down eventually, but there wasn't a lot of further exam that needed down there because it. Well, what's the significance? I mean, did it look like she, she had some burns? She had burns and kind of, yeah, the significance as we're putting together, you know, we're putting this all together. We're, we're saying with the head injury of the burns, we're, we're putting all these things together because we put them together because we need to know what happened so we know how to treat the patient, what's going on. And the burns looked as though, uh, it, because it was just on the chest and not up, like it burned up from her walking in through, through fire or something like that. Um, and the way it was on her chest, and like I say, it was like up on her neck. Um, to me, it looked like uh, whatever had been uh, on fire um, had been either splashed or porn or but it was directly applied to her chest is how it looked um, because of the way it was burnt patterns on her chest um, so let me ask you this yeah Are these consistent with the injuries you'd suspect if gas was splashed on something yeah if the gas was ignited and if somebody had walked through the fire instead of the fire coming to them if they had walked through the fire 
What's the significance of the boots and shoes? Boots, shoes would definitely show signs of that. And they were, like I said, it was like leather, black boots, and there was no sign of any, any uh, scuffs or burnt or soot or anything on So as far as she going to the fire or the fire coming to her, what do those observations teach you? Uh, that the fire came right to her. I mean, it's the kind of thing that, you know, you see the splash mark, like if, uh, you know, grease or, or gasoline or something was directly applied that we would see and have seen in, in you know, situations. Um, that's, that's how it appeared. Do you have uh, any blood in her ear? Yeah, so in the exam of her head, uh, besides all the, I could say, multiple lacerations, um, and some we probably didn't even find until they uh, shaved her hair because she was so matted, um, there was blood in her ear canals, which to us is a um, significant finding. Um, whether it's blood or clear fluid, uh, clear fluid could be the cerebral spinal fluid, but blood to, um, if it's coming out of the ear canals uh, with this kind of impact to her head and injuries, then we're thinking now that she's bleeding around her brain um, in her skull. And does that? Absolutely. Um, without, um, with the trauma and lacerations to her head, um, I would, we, we were, you know, quite positive that this would be a skull fracture that caused this bleeding in the brain. You said you responded to thousands of cases from grandma falling over and all sorts of things. Had you ever seen blood in the ear, skull fractures, with a history of somebody just falling over? No. It's, uh, to have blood in the ear is the only time I've seen that and have uh, trauma that causes the bleeding and bleed in the ears. It's always a very high impact trauma. Um, we, I've seen it with motorcycle accidents or pedestrians being hit by a car. It's always a very high impact, um, never a simple fall. Um, even our, yeah, for falls, I mean, even our trauma, state trauma criteria never considers a, a fall unless it's greater than 20 feet as being a high impact. But it always takes a high impact to, to cause a skull fracture like that. And was there anything about the injuries to her head, place that you saw them and whatnot, that could give you some guidance as to whether you had to treat one injury, multiple injuries, or whatnot? Uh, there are definitely multiple injuries there, and I think that was kind of, uh, as we're trying to put this whole picture together, you know, we have the burns, we have the trauma to the head, I think that was one of the things that, as we're looking at these multiple injuries, initially, as we're, because our mindset as she's first coming into our ambulance is, um, you know, this is a burn victim, this is a patient who was trying to get out of the fire and she's unconscious because of that event. And we see the injury to her head and think, well, could she ran into a wall or something? You know, it's like, wait a minute, why does she have a big laceration? And then as we examine her further and we see the bleed in the ears, which indicates possible skull fracture, along with multiple lacerations to her head, um, we quickly um, dismiss that idea because, because of the multiple lacerations to us, it was clear this, this looked as though an assault, not one blunt trauma, anything like that. It wasn't blunt, it was sharp. Um, um, I wouldn't expect to see those injuries from like a, 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 a blunt, uh, what we call trauma, like a, a head to a wall or you know, directly to one object at one time. It would be multiple um, assaults to the head. That's how it appeared. I want to clarify one thing you just said. Okay. Multiple assaults to the head. Yeah, because there are multiple wounds and in similar and other locations, and you just wouldn't have that from one impact. So. Anderson, thanks for answering my questions. I don't have any questions. Let me uh, have a quick sidebar. We may get you to have come back tomorrow. So we schedule the issue to come back at nine tomorrow. Okay. Is that more clear? I can get it. Perfect.